Friday, I don't even think it had set in really that it was happening. Um, and, and just potentially how hard it could actually be. It really hadn't set in yet. And I tried to just keep it at bay and just think like, what's the worst that could happen? I'm just riding my bike all day long, 103.7 miles. Let's just do it. This year is super weird because we didn't have the, the gathering, right? We didn't have the mass amount of humans and activity and scheduling and all of the things turned on normally the way we normally have it. So in normally Friday, the 50K is happening and we're at, you know, the finish line's already pumping. Live music last year we had going. So I had this weird, this weird feeling and I don't even think on Friday I had decided for sure, like, I'm gonna ride tomorrow, in my head. I don't think I'd actually really committed to it. But the whole week before, the crew was saying, hey, ride, ride on Saturday. Go, go do it. So yeah, man, I think, I don't, I don't think I really wrapped my head around until Friday, and then that's when we actually built the Storm Chaser. We didn't finally put it together until Friday morning. <laughs> I hadn't ridden it in uh, pretty much a year. Maybe last April, I think, was the last time I'd actually ridden the Storm Chaser in its original configuration. But yeah, Friday morning, I think, was when I finally, the day before, <laughs> kicked it in and said, okay, I'm gonna ride my bike tomorrow and potentially it's gonna be super hard. And uh, yeah, I would say that was, that's an understatement. <laughs> But we're incredibly privileged to be able to have these machines that will take us on these roads to do these types of events. And so over the years, for me anyway, it's, it's because it's not, I'm not result oriented by any means. It's just I want to experience the land and I want to experience the event in its entirety. And I want to experience getting to the finish line. To me, the, the, you know, the finish line for everyone is it's the it's kind of the main goal, right? It's don't miss out on everything that's happening throughout the day, but that's the main goal. So Friday night, I just wanted to relax. We just chilled, I listened to some jazz and went to bed super, super early and just thought like, don't get too wrapped up in your mind with the fact of how hard tomorrow is going to be. Because we knew it, we knew the rain was falling. We knew it was gonna rain potentially two or three different times throughout the night, thunderstorms. There was lightning when I woke up on Saturday. The backside of the course after mile 60, I was thinking, man, these roads are gonna be wild fast. They could probably dry really, really quickly. This, this could potentially be one of the easiest courses we've had, even if it rains. And uh, I was terribly wrong. <laughs> it does not need to be any harder, <laughs> any harder. But in my mind, Friday night going to bed, in my mind, 12 hours. I thought, you know what, if it's muddy, we'll see, we'll see what I can do. I've never done a century single speed. And that was playing with my head too. Like, how, how, how am I gonna feel climbing? The, the rain had stopped, the shop was e eerily calm, super calm. There wasn't a ton of people. Everyone was waiting to the last minute to get here too. Of course, we all blow out of town Saturday morning. And we all stuck together about to, to Ingalls, so about mile nine. And I was working so hard to try and keep with everybody. It was, it was perfectly dry on 19th, you know, a little, little tacky here and there, but pretty much 100% rideable all the way to mile 20. <clears throat> it was 100% rideable. And I tried to stay with the group. So my first bonk came around mile nine. <laughs> Thought, okay. You need to slow down. You need to back off. <clears throat> we get to the Shea. Kelly from Aspen Coffee's at the Shea Lounge. We had beers, took photos, and then that's where the 50 mile and 100 split, and that was the very first hike bike. So be even before we got to VFW Road, we're on North Mount Vernon, and it was immediate, immediate hike bike. Storm Chaser immediately showed itself more capable than any other bike out there as where I, I think I rode past all the people that had 
gotten away from me before the Shea Lounge within half a mile. The bike just, it just doesn't care, man. It doesn't care. I, that's the, the thing that keeps coming back to my mind is that if you have the power to push it, the bike will, the bike will do it. There were times where I could push the bike even with accumulated mud because the clearance is so, so good where everyone else could, couldn't roll, couldn't push the bike at all. So that was an advantage as well. I, I only had to carry the bike two or three different times after Pawnee on my back or on my shoulder. But the, mo the majority of the time I was, I was able to roll it with all of the mud. In. Didn't bring gloves, I forgot a paint stick. Don't forget a paint stick, man, it's so important, especially if you have gears. But I was just using my hand, and by the end of the day, my hand was so dry. The, the mud just sucked all of the moisture out of it, but was just using it as a scraper, you know. We get to Pawnee, uh, the gas station there had a, had a hose out, it was so cool. Everybody's washing their bikes, and I thought, no, I want my bike to be as filthy as possible whenever I get done, so I'm not gonna clean it, I'm not gonna lube the chain, I'm not gonna do anything. Had a bunch of food there, carried an extra huge Coke in my side pocket, and I thought, I've already bonked twice on the way to, to Pawnee. I'm gonna eat these disgusting chicken fingers from the, the gas station that I think had been there all morning. No offense, they were just old. I'm sure that they were <laughs> good when they came out of the fryer. But I ate those, had a Snickers. Um, a friend of mine, Scott Shipman, him and his kids brought me an Uncrustables. I've never had an Uncrustables before, it's fantastic. Uh, anyway, I got fully recharged and I left I left there on my own. And then, and then, yeah, man, when we hit mile 52, the very most northern road, I don't even know the name of the road. We, it, 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 on the map, it's just got a number but up there by Sooner Lake. That's when, that's when things just got wild. I caught up with all these other people, again, that left Pawnee before me. <clears throat> and so a group of us, 10 or 15, were just spread out on this six mile section of road. But yeah, from mile 53 to 63, took us over three hours. So yeah, about what, 3.33 miles per hour on average. That road was rowdy. And the bridge is out down at mile 53. So I mean, there wasn't traffic coming through to, to really pack the roads down in any place. And there, it was just, it was quintessential Mid-South conditions. It was exactly what I hoped I would get to experience by doing the event. I, of course, I would, I would be pumped to do it if it was dry, just to be out there for 100 miles, see our roads they are incredibly fun. I tell everyone, don't want it to be wet. I don't want it to be muddy at our event. I don't want you to break your bike. But because we've had this folklore of these bad, super bad years, these super bad conditions, of course the one year that I decide I'm gonna throw my leg over a bike and do it, I, I, want, I want that. And I, and I got it, man, I got it full on. Bridge it out. Yes. Mile 53, feeling okay. Not a strong single speeder, it's okay though. It's rock and roll. <sighs> yep, this is what we came for. Let's do it. This guy asked me, he came up and he's like, man, you know the course. How much longer is it gonna be like this? And at that point, we had been walking, you know, four or five miles at, a, at, at that at stretch. So we were about halfway through that section. So just creeping into the later, like mile 57, mile 58. And I, I just said, man, dude, I'm, I'm afraid to answer that question. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> the last 10 miles took three hours, dude. What? <laughs> Crazy. It does not care about anyone. It doesn't care about your back or anybody's back. It doesn't care about your road. It doesn't care about you. No. It just goes, man. It's so sick. It makes me wish I was strong. But I knew that mile 80, we had the Oasis. So we had beer, we had Cokes, we had water. There was music out there. But yeah, I just wanted to lay down for a minute. My whole body, like, had bruises from my saddle being on my shoulder. and. My whole body just felt like, what just happened? What are you doing to it? And uh, I thought there's only one more section in my mind after mile 80 that potentially could be bad. And I think I'm gonna hit it in the dark. So like, 
pound of beer, I'm gonna pound of coke. Like, let's get rowdy and let's get out of here. But then I think that was this next section, North Hackleman Road. It was mile 80 to mile 92 is where, it, that's where it gets like into it. You know, the rest of it, the, you're in the middle of the day, there's something about being on the bike, either when the sun comes up or when the sun goes down. There is something indescribably, I don't know, it's transformative. I always try and eke every little bit of sunlight out of the, out of the sky before I turn my lights on because I, I don't want the artificialness of the light to change my perspective of the road or of my surroundings. When the sun starts to go down, it's like, okay, now like, now the adventure is like, now it's happening and I, I love it there's some there's just something about it and the, the epicness of, of starting a ride and ending it with completely different light there's no way to describe how that makes you feel it, it, it makes you feel alive it makes you feel absolutely in the moment in the present in the mix and I think that was some of my favorite moments of the entire event as soon as we hit mile 92, we're gonna hit head back east, and then of course the wind was still blowing out of the east. And we had six miles to head east, and the only thing I had in my mind was, man, I really hope my friends are at the finish line. <laughs> and I don't know how many people are gonna be there, but I can only imagine what someone doing the event when it's normal with the finish line structure, with us there to welcome them. You know, of course, if we're doing hugs, hopefully in the future we're doing hugs, and we've got beer, and you know, lining the streets with humans and the music playing. I, I can't imagine what that would feel like as a normal participant. I, I, of course, didn't get that experience, but I was just hoping that there would be somebody there. And I, all I could think about champagne, I really wanted a bottle of champagne. <laughs> and of course, a beer, but um, I hit the last two blocks and could see a pile of friends by the new patio outside Zanotti's downtown. And I just thought, I'm gonna sprint as hard as I can. <laughs> so I got up and man, the bike, Again, just never hesitated all day long through all the mud. And uh, I got sprayed with beer, had some champagne. All my friends were there. People wanted to hug, tried our best to like keep distance. <laughs> it was like, of course we want to party and hug, but not yet. We're not there yet. But yeah, I couldn't believe it, man. I couldn't believe I had the opportunity to take the time to do the ride. My body, even though I hadn't been training at all, was physically able. I want people to know that. I am no great cyclist. I will never say that. So if I can do this with as little to zero training on a brand new bike that we built the day before, you can do it too. Um, and then there's something about the single speed sim that made it so simple, so simple. I just did not have to think about the bike at all. And I would say a lot of single speeds would be that way, but with the tire clearance and the Storm Chaser, it just did not care at all. It was so much fun to just push and just know that, all right, no matter what I'm doing, forward movement is the plan. And the bike was along for the ride the whole way, um, underneath a very, very non-strong rider. <laughs> Beautiful out there. Our course, any of our courses, especially this one though, are, they're wild and they're hard, even if it's dry. But in the mud, it's a whole different ball game. It's, it's, a, it's a game of mental fortitude. Can you do it? Yes. If there's water in the ground, ride through it. Push your bike through it and just move on. The finish line will be there. So yeah, this one I'm gonna like, I'm gonna cherish it big time. I'm gonna hold it dear. I think it's, it's one of the wildest days I've had on a bike ever. I'm still digesting all that, I think, but I had a blast and I would do, I would, I would do it again and not change a thing. Not change a thing, I would do it again tomorrow.
can't see him anymore. It's bonking a little. It's a little, it's a tiny bonk. Alright, we're gonna